Welcome all. As we wait for the remaining participants to join, please enjoy the Kumi Now promotional video that we'll show shortly. People of faith, Kumi. People of faith, Kumi Now, rise up and take action. Respond to the cry of millions seeking your attention. Kumi Now reflects the urgency for peace and security based on justice, nonviolent resistance, and inclusivity. With focus on international law and UN resolutions, we need to exert pressure on powers for just solutions. No peace or security can prevail in the Middle East without addressing the Palestinian rights, to say the least. Welcome all who are just joining. Uh, thank you for joining this online meeting. Uh, we're excited to have you all here. Before we begin, we have a few housekeeping points to cover um, so the session can run as smoothly as possible. The session is being broadcasted live on Facebook, so if you don't wish to appear, please turn off your video feed. We'll be muting everyone during the session except for those speaking. If you wish to speak, please use the raise hand option under participants or indicate in the chat to Kumi team individual. Individuals will not be able to unmute themselves. If you wish to ask a question of the speakers, please type it into the chat box. When it comes to questions at the end of the session, we'll use questions shared in the chat or from the questions received earlier by email. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat to message Kumi team privately, and we'll try to help you with them. We hope you will find this session interesting and informative. Now here is Jan Dark Sonora, from Sibyl for the welcome and introduction to the sessions. Welcome again to the first Kumi Now online meeting. We know that everyone is on the internet nowadays, but we see this as an opportunity to fulfill the main goal of Kumi Now, bringing people around the world together with the organizations on the ground in Palestine and Israel. We know there are people around the world that want to make a difference. We know there are dozens, even hundreds, of great organizations working for human rights, both abroad and here in Palestine and Israel. But for activists, half a world away, it is daunting to know what to do and how to make a difference. While organizations focused on fulfilling their missions find it difficult for numerous reasons to get their message out and find the help they need. They might not have the time or the language skills or the technical expertise to do so, and any attempt at reaching a larger audience has to compete with the latest video on Facebook, the latest series on Netflix, or the powerful propaganda machine, or simply all of the other problems and worthy causes in the world today. For example, as we've done all the research for Kumi now, we've come across some quite remarkable short documentaries that have sat languishing on YouTube for months and months. Can they fix the sound? How do we get these messages out? This is where Kumi now comes in, and this is where you come in. Kumi now has been building trying to make these connections. Everyone likes the idea, and everyone acknowledges the need. With these Kumi Now online sessions, we hope to take this network building to the next level. Bringing activists and organizations one step closer together, and starting a myriad of discussions, small and large, about how we were together to multiply our impact. Make no mistake, we are up against the propaganda machine that is well-funded and very well organized. They have dedicated ads, mailing lists, social media actions, letter writing campaigns, so on and so forth, all designed to push a narrative in support of settlement, while erasing Palestinian ties to the land and erasing Israeli violations of international law from the record. 
which brings us today and this week as we partner with the Palestine Museum of Natural History and look at the environmental impact of the occupation. Um, and at this point, I would like to things over to Dr. Meza Bouzidia, the director of the Palestine Institute for Biodiversity and uh, Sustainability at Bethlehem University to tell exactly what is happening on the ground and of the work of the museum to document and counter the effects of occupation. Thank you. Is anybody speaking now? You, Dr. Mazen. Sorry? You, Dr. Mazen. Okay, because I couldn't hear anything that was said earlier. It was very low. Yeah. So I don't know what, what was being said. But anyways, um, thank you very much for this. Let me uh, just share the video. And let me uh, share my screen with you. Uh, and uh, is everybody, I suppose, hearing me okay? So, uh, just one minute. Um, all right, thank you very much everybody for attending and uh, for uh, this uh, introduction. Um, I will uh, speak very briefly and then uh, we have three people that will join us and speak about their personal experiences. That's Elias, Rina, and Samar Shaheen. Um, basically, I want to just tell you briefly in a few minutes about situation in Palestine very quickly and then we'll move to what actions can be taken in this regard. Of course, Palestine is at the center of continents and migrations of birds and also of humans uh, migrated out of East Africa through Palestine. We are also part of the Fertile Crescent where humans developed agriculture, uh, domesticated things like wheat, barley, lentils, chickpeas, hummus if you want, things like that. Uh, also animals like goats and sheep. Uh, but anyways, uh, the situation now, uh, many of you are, of course, familiar with it because you have either visited here or are keeping track of what's going on. Uh, but the situation is that we live in these uh, small islands, archipelago of islands. These archipelago of islands stretch from the Galilee in the north to the Negev in the south, with the West Bank in between and Gaza in the west. As, a, as its own island, if you want. This is similar to what happened in apartheid in South Africa, where the blacks were relegated to uh, Bantustans or ghettos for them. And this percentage of land that's allocated to us, which is now 8.3%, is actually decreasing. So it may end up as a percentage of the land equivalent to the percentage in uh, North America that's left for Native Americans in the reservations. And actually the shrinking map of Palestine was inspired by the map below it of the shrinking United States. Uh, my son saw the shrinking US, so he drew the one for Palestine and now it's used uh, a lot. Uh, we of course have a huge injustice on many issues, many fronts, and I will just give you very brief examples. Because again, I don't want to focus here on the symptoms or on the diagnosis. I just want to more focus on the solutions and the therapies, if you want. If we talk about symptoms, for example, water distribution, very highly unequal. Uh, Palestinians get less than 100 uh, uh, liters per uh, person per day, which is uh, what the World Health Organization recommends for healthy living. 
Israelis, whether in the settlements or inside the green line, get many folds more. Uh, Gaza, as you know, the situation is very horrible. Uh, it's unlivable, according to the United Nations. Uh, and that's partly because of the, uh, of the gas fields off the coast of Gaza, of Gaza that Israel wants. Uh, these offshore gas fields uh, have billions of dollars worth of gas, and Israel likes to keep them. That's why Gaza is besieged and blockaded, and, and people are really suffering. Uh, we Palestinians, of course, suffer a lot, and I, again, I don't want to overemphasize these aspects, but over 100,000 of us have been killed, over 800,000 have been uh, injured, and, and now I know over 1 million people have been detained or imprisoned, including children, of course, and the prisoners face particular uh, problematic issues. Uh, now, the world is connected, and the world is very small. If you look at it from the moon, it's this one blue planet. And all our problems and all our solutions are connected at some level. So if I look at what's happening now with the uprising Intifada, uh, you know, for Black Lives Matter in the U.S., which spread not just in the U.S., uh, many states having demonstrations, but also uh, in London, uh, in front of the U.S. Embassy and other places. Uh, these things are connected to the whole world. Why? i give you a very simple example. For example, this officer that's uh, putting his knee on the neck of George Floyd, uh, these officers in Minnesota were sent to Israel um, to train. And Israel is the one who uh, thought of this uh, neck knee on the neck kind of policy and I actually uh, received it at one point you can see it on the lower right hand corner with me on the ground and the knee on my neck <laughs> but that's a, that's an Israeli policy that has been uh, military have used and they have uh, trained the American police to use and this uh, this militarizing of American police has significant portion of it is due to uh, Israeli attempts to militarize American police, thinking that that's uh, going to be helpful with them. Now, I think part of it is, of course, the racism that's inherent in thinking of all the Arab Muslims and Christian population of this country as an enemy American white police are thinking of the black African Americans, Hispanics as enemies. Uh, this is also part of the propaganda, part of the uh, brainwashing that they receive on a daily uh, basis, basically. Um, now, <clears throat> you know, I always find it amusing that people talk about looting uh, in the US or elsewhere. Um, Looting, of course, is part and parcel of the criminal colonial systems, whether in the U.S., South Africa, or Palestine. Uh, looting of, of a whole country, in our case. Palestine was looted, for example, as was the U.S. was looted from Native Americans. In our case, 500 villages are destro were destroyed and ethnically cleansed. You can see the red dots on the map on the right. And, uh, and this looting of, of the country, basically, uh, is uh, faced with resistance, of course. And for any colonizers, resistance is considered, of course, uh, a kind of a, a no-no. And that's terrorism. It doesn't matter whether it's peaceful or non-peaceful resistance. It doesn't matter. Uh, but anyways, the uh, the environmental and other impacts of this looting, uh, whether here or in South Africa or in the U.S. with the killing, killing of millions of buffaloes by the European settlers or many others, are common phenomena in these things. I want to just highlight a couple of environmental issues. When the colonizers drained the wetlands of the Hula, for example, area in the north, uh, the lake, Hula Lake and wetlands, 
uh, which were host to many migrating species uh, that went extinct or uh, vocally disappeared. For example, um, uh, when Israel uh, as a new society, new uh, colonial system started in 1948-49, in the 50s they diverted the water of the Jordan Valley from Lake Tiberias uh, to the western parts of the country, draining up basically the Jordan Valley, shrinking the Dead Sea as you see here. And now there's another project that's a mega project that's very destructive environmentally, which is to take water from the Red Sea to the Dead Sea. And uh, this uh, involves desalination plants, pumping stations, etc. Uh, this project costs about $20 billion. The canal and its uh, uh, entities are all put on the Jordanian side of the border for a very good reason. Uh, they put it on the Jordanian side so that Jordan as a government will uh, carry the debt uh, for the World Bank and the IMF that are funding this. And this is the way the World Bank and IMF works in third world countries. I put projects the countries don't need and they uh, thus they enslave the country basically to their whims when the country cannot pay the uh, principal and interest on these loans. Um, other smaller actions, but yet also very devastating, like the colonial settlements that are built, whether residential settlements or industrial settlements that are built on stolen Palestinian land, looted, if I may use the term, Palestinian areas and lands. Uh, for example, as you can see here, uh, Jabal Abu Ghanim, uh, Palestinian area in which my relatives own some land in it, uh, and, uh, and how it transformed to become the Israeli colony of Har Roma. Uh, they also put industrial settlements among uh, us, and there's genotoxic effects of this, which we study. We also have climate change here, human-induced, of course, climate change, where temperature is increasing and rainfall is decreasing. This will have devastating impact on developing countries, including ours. Uh, we try to do some things about that with our projects, like, for example, this project we did with Zoe Environment Network from Geneva, funded by the city of Geneva, where we did some uh, uh, training for school kids. Uh, Elias can tell you also about this. Um, and of course, then we got the corona, uh, totally unexpected uh, in terms of the world, but uh, actually scientists, including I, have written about the possibility of pandemics many, many years ago and how they could really devastate the economies. Uh, but Palestine is not any different than any other country. We do have uh, corona cases. We're a very small country. In the West Bank and Gaza, 650 cases have been recorded. And the state of Palestine, uh, uh, or the nascent state of Palestine, developed a response plan to the COVID-19, which is uh, pretty decent, actually. And, and we did get some supplies and so forth. We are concerned especially about the prisoners because Israel holds thousands of Palestinian political prisoners. Israel released uh, Jewish Israeli prisoners, criminals and otherwise, uh, but they didn't release Palestinian prisoners and the prisons are overcrowded as you know. And, uh, and this will be very devastating. We don't know the situation in the prisons. We have no information about this situation. We also have to remember that for uh, COVID-19, uh, it is not just an issue of uh, how many people are dying in each country. It is a fact that people who die in, from COVID-19 are actually the poor people, the minority groups, etc. For example, this is England. You can see uh, the average overall uh, 10 or, or so deaths uh, per 100,000. Uh, whereas uh, the white small amount increase over that average. Uh, but uh, if you look at the black Caribbean, other black Indians in the UK, they certainly suffer the most. 
Brazil is the same way. Brazil is uh, horrible. It's next to the U.S. basically. Uh, and it's also run by a lunatic just like the U.S. and just like Israel here with Netanyahu. And, uh, and these people don't care about people dying. And, uh, and if you look at the number of cases in Brazil that continues to climb as are the numbers of deaths, is one thing, but if you look at who is dying again, you find native uh, people from the Amazon are dying most and so forth. All right. Um, okay, this is, I, I depressed you enough with the situation of the world, but I'm sure you are familiar with this from before. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what we are doing. And what we did is an institute for biodiversity and sustainability. We're part of Bethlehem University. We have a Museum of Natural History. Our mission is on research, education, conservation. Our motto is respect for ourselves, for others, and for nature. And we base our actions based on the uh, very good, actually, sustainable development goals uh, for, from the UN. There are 17 sustainable development goals relating to hunger, poverty, environment, other mm -hmm. things. So we work along those lines. All our projects are projects associated with other groups. We like collaborative work. So we have projects with National Geographic, Darwin Initiative, um, you know, Rotary Club, many, many other groups. Um, for example, we have projects that uh, we are doing some work in, uh, in an area here near Bethlehem uh, called uh, Al Makhrur Valley. And there are four communities, Bejala, uh, Hussain, Batir, and al Walaja, that are benefiting from our activities, as are the uh, nature and the animals and plants of the valley as uh, protecting nature and protecting animals at the same time. We work with the children a lot and with uh, school uh, students and university students. And we believe in action rather than uh, lecturing. So people do things uh, by hand, like here, recycling paper or plastics or other things. Our keys to success is that we did uh, mostly based on uh, scientific knowledge, research, everything. We even researched coronavirus. We researched uh, when Israel uh, dumped uh, white phosphorus in Gaza. I researched it and then we sent information to doctors in Gaza about how to treat it. We like to do things about the re with the research, with good knowledge. Uh, the second uh, cause of our success, as I mentioned earlier, is that we do everything by collaboration locally and internationally. And we encourage you, any of you, to come and volunteer with us. When things are opened up, you can come and volunteer. But you can also volunteer from where you are. Um, and, uh, and we have other keys to success, as mentioned. Our last venture, which is just starting, is called Palestine Action for the Planet and uh, PAP. And this is part of Extinction Rebellion, and it's an idea to, to, for us to work on our environment through, uh, you know, reusing, recycling, reducing, etc. the typical things that you can think of. <laughs> Now, you can join, of course, in the struggle in many ways. And on my website, which is kumsiya.org, there are more than 72 ways. There is a reason for the number 72. But anyways, uh, 72 ways for action. Every year I add one action. Uh, and, uh, you know, boycott, divestment, and sanctions are, uh, are one way you can join. Uh, if you want to join with us in the museum, certainly we welcome this. As I said, you can volunteer from where you are. Uh, you can uh, uh, go on our website. There's some videos there. You can watch these videos. You can also donate uh, on that website. Uh, all donations are also can be tax deductible in the U.S. and other countries because we have friends of Best Time University at uh, in the u.s that receives tax deductible donations and uh, we we welcome your support in other ways not just money of course helping if you have any skills or if you can network us with people 
we would love uh, to, to hear from you. Um, now I want to just introduce uh, the three uh, other speakers, if they are all there, uh, to briefly tell you about their own experiences. Uh, one of the goals when we started this institute, this museum and institute, my wife Jessie and I actually donated what part of what we saved in the U.S. when I worked in the U.S. We donated $250,000 to start this at Bethlehem University. But part of the reason we did this is we wanted to work with young people and encourage young people, whether school students, university students, etc. So the three young people you will hear from now um, are people who associate with the museum in some fashion or another, either all of them actually volunteered at the museum before we hired them. And so uh, they, you can hear from them directly about their story. I won't introduce them beyond this. I will let them tell you about themselves. And I will start, uh, Samar, are you there? If you can unmute Samar Shaheen uh, and Elias Handal is the other one, and Rina Saeed. Uh, if you can unmute the three of them and let's, uh, let's hear from them, please. Uh, Yes, but, uh, uh, very well, but I think Rina has like technical issue, so she just apologized to join. Okay. I made so Summer, uh, you okay, want to so start, and then Elias? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Go ahead, Summer. Uh huh. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks just for this opportunity and I would like to thank Dr. Mazen for introducing me to all of you. I just, uh, my name is Samar Shaheen and I live uh, in a small and small countryside village. Uh, it, it's kind of like area C if you're familiar of, uh, there is like three um, political uh, areas in Palestine, A, B, C. So I live in area C which is um like uh, i live in a settlement so um like uh, i got just um, difficulties for transportation uh, to go to the university first of all and then to the museum after i got just hired and after that uh, um, there is many other uh, difficulties as palestinians and as a palestinian and um, uh, like uh, one of the challenges that we all live here in Palestine. So it's kind of uh, hard to move uh, from the place that I will, where I live. It just takes 20 minutes from the, uh, in the car directly to go from my house to the museum. But uh, it's just really hard to get out from there. Like uh, it takes like one, sometimes one and a half hour um, to get like three transportations. Uh, with the public or sometimes private uh, transportation. So this is one and on the other hand from like my personal um, challenges, difficulties if you want to say, uh, of living in a such uh, area like that which which is really frustrating and sometimes disappointed to live in such area. Uh, it's by the way called Beit Iskari in Arabic and uh, the uh, Jewish name if we want to say, uh, Goshetion. And it's one of the dangerous uh, um, uh, settlements. So as being an agricultural um, specialist or agricultural engineer, it's really hard to, to think about my own project and cannot just make it on the ground and achieve it just because of the stupid rules, let's say, because um, it's not allowed to build the water well cisterns just to use the uh, infrastructures and to build a greenhouse at least. So I cannot just uh, support my father, he's a farmer and like he's every day got challenges and a bit problems. Like yesterday or the day before yesterday, we just um, repaired, broke uh, and uh, punctured uh, uh, drip irrigation system just because settlers, they attack uh, like weekly or sometimes. Uh, mostly our drip irrigation system. So I wanted to move this uh, uh, or just to share these challenges with you and 
like uh, to share a little bit of my hard life there but from the other side and the shiny part of my life like i get used of these things and to go like all of these difficulties and to cross all of these so i just hired and worked after being a, a volunteer with the museum like just dr mazen mentioned so uh, after that i just hired on darwin project which is uh, uh, biodiversity conservation and uh, community development and then I started encouraging other, uh, other uh, farmers. Uh, there are like uh, 80, 81 farmers. They are supposed to be 80 farmers, but then we are not just, uh, we could not uh, fund or uh, cover the uh, expenses to, uh, to cover more farmers, but all of them in the, these four loca uh, localities that Dr. Mazen mentioned, they want like to be part of this project to benefit. We are supporting them, giving them um, agricultural extension, some sample tools, uh, seeds, local seeds, of course, and um, it's, it's transplants, seedlings, and um, with all of these uh, simple, uh, let's say, uh, uh, materials, we were trying to support them. So, um, and like most of the time, like we give them trainings and uh, uh, to uh, to more to to raise their capacities or their already uh, they are uh, they get an experience. But we we want to uh, re uh, to increase this in, uh, experience. So um, we share with them our experience and we take uh, like uh, uh, their uh, wise uh, practices and the traditional practices like in Batir, uh, they have the um, terraces, which is part of our traditions. And uh, we always just um, uh, support them and uh, uh, like uh, there is uh, like there is um, uh, how I can say um, traditional uh, eggplant festival and uh, we are trying just um, uh, to be part of this festival and uh, from in the other hand like there is a uh, Hosan uh, village um, there is a new three farmers uh, from the, um, uh, the their lands actually uh, is in the settlement. It's called the uh, Bitar Elite Settlement, and they could not just reach their lands uh, until, like, we tried to uh, to be part of, with uh, their uh, resilience and trying to persuade soldiers to uh, to pass the checkpoint and uh, to let them just go and reach their lands at least. And right now they become like from time to time when we are just with them, uh, they get their lands and plant it and uh, try at least to harvest the the um, the product that has been for years uh, non harvested. So there is many and many, and I could not just um, uh, summarize all of these difficulties, encouraging that we uh, give other farmers in just five or 10 minutes. I could say like one day or two days, I will not just stop mentioning these things. And I just would like to uh, let my other colleagues to talk a little bit about their experiences and their challenges they face, and they hope that they will uh, just tell you about. So thanks again, and just will let others. Okay. To, to Thank talk. you, Samar. Elias, if you could un unmute Elias Handel. Hello, uh, everyone. Yeah, go ahead. We don't That's see you, Elias. If you want to put the video so that people can see what you look like. <laughs> uh, Elias just had his appendix removed also, so I'm grateful that he is able to join us. Hello everyone. So you can hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Good. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mason and Samar, my colleague, for for this amazing introduction and sharing the, the experience. And I would like from uh, this point to continue and sharing another experience that uh, I got when I started at the museum. So. First, uh, I'm Elias Handel. I'm working as a curator of zoology section at the museum and a researcher. So in the beginning, I used to be only uh, 
student who's in love with something, something called biodiversity, but uh, unfortunately, because of the, I'm not, I'm not gonna say the occupation, but the situation, the political situation that we have, uh, we don't have such uh, uh, title jobs or, 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 uh, or hobbies like to study environment and stuff because we are busy in, in how to protect ourselves and stuff. But after Dr. Mazin came from the US, he, he started teaching in, at Bethlehem University and we as a young people and in love with this stuff, we start to uh, uh, know him more and introduce how, how we can uh, yani protect our, our, our land and, and look for our uh, uh, fauna and how to use it for, for more sustainability and other stuff. So then we start as a volunteers, then he, he shared with us his dream to to have a museum and an institute for biodiversity and sustainability and and thanks god that everything become true and still need more work in, in from inside and outside but uh, what i would like to, uh, to, to share with you guys today that uh one time i was speaking with dr Mazen and i told him that i have like uh, if my family has a big land like 35 34 dunams each dome which mean like uh, 1000 meters square it's five it's five minutes walking from the museum and he told me yeah Ella, let's go i told him it's, it's difficult because it's after the segregation wall and it, it was really a, a tough time when the when 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 the israeli took the land because it's it's got like more than 300 olive trees actually that they are really old ones and we couldn't reach them only after eight years, eight, eight years after the Israeli army gave us a special, even special uh, permission to go there for, for harvesting the olives and stuff. So when we got there, me and my family and other colleagues that their land near our land, we saw that uh, most of the olives dead, uh, that the land destroyed, burned, and some of the land because, yeah, I'm going to tell you this one. There is a law that you can cut any olive tree. But what, what the army did to, to build the settlements, they bury all the tree with soil. So we don't uh, uh, broke the rules, but <laughs> they took the land, unfortunately. Uh, it really was sad to see, that the, especially the old people, because they teach us how land is really important for any human beings and to see people crying for their land, uh, basically burying their land under settlements and stuff. And the other experience when we start working at the museum, we start going on field trips in different areas in the West Bank to collect uh, insects, fauna and flora and stuff to do, to do studies and stuff. But when we, if, if, if you came to Palestine before, you're going to know that we have checkpoints in, in between districts and between cities and, and, and even between villages. And so surprisingly, they each time stopped us in different uh, checkpoints to check why do you have all these data? I mean, just remove it. Sometimes we have got, got problem with, with the army because we, we got specimens to study. And it was difficult just in the, in the beginning to, to let them understand that we are really uh, 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 doing science stuff, scientists and stuff and research. And uh, after a while it become a, a, I mean, more common this stuff and we, we, we got the power and the knowledge after we hear Dr. Mazin for several times speaking about human rights and occupation and how to to to, uh, to, to, to speak with 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 the soldiers I need to, to de defeat ourselves and to get what, uh, what we need so this is basically what uh, what I have to share with you I hope uh, it's, it's it's helpful and another time I would like to thank Dr. Mazin for this opportunity to speak about the situation and thank for him especially to, because he's really an, a, an active man who's who's trying to to solve things let, let's say peacefully and and looking forward to Palis to palestinian country sustainable without the needs of of of, uh, of big country that only um, care about politics and thank you again all right uh... Uh, thank you very much, Elias and uh, Samar. The third person, I don't know if Rina managed to get in or not, but Rina uh, lives in Zabab, the area in the north, Rina Said, and she is uh, in charge of the public relations and media aspects of the museum. Again, she started with us as a volunteer and continued. Uh, now we employ her in the museum. Uh, there's a number of questions that are raised, and some of them are already being answered by the host. 
for example, uh, somebody asked if they could have the uh, PowerPoint that I presented, and uh, yes, uh, so he shared, Brian shared it to everyone. Uh, if you go in the chat room, you can put your questions, and I'm happy to take them. And if you feel you want to direct them to Summer or Elias, please also say so. Um, uh, I will just uh, read a little bit of what was, uh, what, if there's any questions. So we are also on Facebook, as you know. The Facebook page is also linked there, and I presume this is recorded so people also uh, we can view it later and share it with their friends and that I would encourage you to do that if you feel that the information of use to you. But anyway, please feel free to write your questions um, uh, on the chat room so that we can answer. Uh, uh, Connie, for example, is asking how is the situation in Batir and al Makhrur? I've heard there has been a demolition in al Makhrur. Uh, yes, there was a demolition in al Walaja village, uh, uh, in, uh, and there was demolitions also of some structures, including a restaurant in al Makhrur. Uh, there was also a building of an Israeli uh, outpost that they had of al Makhrur Valley near Batir. And we actually wrote to UNESCO about this. UNESCO, as you know, because Al Makhrur is a World Heritage Site, so it was important to do this. And uh, somebody else asked about uh, Kremzan Vineyards and uh, Al Walaja. Al Walaja is a very bad situation. And again, you know, some are worked with the farmers in Al Walaja, Batir, Hussan, and other uh, and Bejala to try and encourage them to uh, cultivate the valley. Uh, their land in a environmentally friendly agriculture and permaculture. And we actually got an expert from Britain to come and help Summer uh, uh, to, to work on this area. Uh, but Kremzan is probably going to be on the other side of the wall. And as you know, also Netanyahu has next all the uh, area seas in the West Bank, including the Jordan Valley and the area that we are talking about, Al Makhrur, Al uh, Walaja, and those areas. And so there is a significant threat to those areas. But that's precisely why we chose to work in these areas. We choose to work in the areas that are most threatened uh, first because we may not have access to them again. Um, so somebody asked about the documentation that police. Uh, uh, in the U.S. train in Israel, including the police that's in uh, Minneapolis. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace is actually gathering more detailed information on this. But if you go to a website called Deadly, what is it, Deadly? Uh, well, uh, I can send you the link, I'll put it in the chat in, uh, in a minute. They have a significant amount of data on this. Uh, uh, deadlyexchange.org, that's what it is, deadlyexchange.org. If you go there, you will get a lot of data on the police, uh, U.S. police exchanging with Israeli military. Uh, let's see, what other questions there are? Um, hmm. What other environmental justice movements do you connect or collaborate with in the struggle from Elsa? Asked. Um, other environmental justice uh, movements around the world, of course, uh, uh, are proliferating now, especially focused on climate change. When we are, I mentioned uh, Extinction Rebellion, for example, uh, but we're also uh, associated with groups like Greenpeace and others, World Wildlife Fund and others, that we try to, to work together on issues and, and highlight the issues of the environment. Um, you know, what I find, if I may say so, is that many environmental groups around the world, like Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Fund, uh, World, uh, Wildlife Fund 
are reluctant to touch Israeli issues because they are uh, <laughs> they are influenced by many Zionists that have infiltrated them and prevent them from uh, working on these issues. There's even Israeli groups that are supposed to be for the environment. Uh, when they built that settlement, for example, Har Homa that I uh, showed you, they started building it under Netanyahu's first term in office, 1997, as prime minister. And uh, I wrote, I was at the U.S. at that time, I wrote to Israeli groups, including, uh, uh, you know, uh, Israeli NGOs and also the governmental Israeli groups that are supposed to to care about the environment because that uprooted a lot of trees near the Bethlehem area. And I was telling them they should put a stop to this just strictly based on the environmental ground. Forget the issue of Palestinian land and our human rights. Okay, you don't care about human rights, but what about the environment? Shouldn't you care about the environment? And they all just dismissed it, and they don't want to challenge the Israeli government in these areas. Uh, burying olive trees by occupation forces. What an ugly and vivid metaphor of subjugation. That's what Elias said, so I agree. That's a comment, not a question. Uh, American tax dollars pay for a significant portion of these abuses. We remain willfully ignorant of these things, indeed, and, and that's intentional. There's a program to make people less informed, and you know it's good that we have fora like this with Kumi Now, and I encourage people to log in to Kumi Now. Now it's going to be every week for new events coming up. So I encourage people to encourage other people and disseminate as much information as you can. And uh, uh, if any of you who is not on our email list to get these kinds of information, please uh, send me an email. Uh, I will put my email, uh, um, my email in the chat room. Uh, just uh, so you can email the, us actually with info at palestinenature.org. So I'll put that in the chat room and you can email us, uh, at least email us to say hi and uh, give me my, your email so that you, we can add you to our email list so that we can inform you of events and information that. Um, uh, then, uh, okay, in uh, IMPT, I don't know what IMPT means, but uh, where do we go now? Let's keep scrolling, there's lots of questions which shows quite an interest, sorry, but uh, I lost now that message. Okay, uh, let me just go back here. Um, what do you know about the high-speed train situation? There's a question. We're running out of time, by the way. I'm gonna pick two or three more questions very quickly and answer them, uh, because uh, the host told me that it's important to keep it at one hour. Uh, but uh, perhaps after uh, this, some people can hang out and informally ask questions, but we need to uh, to limit it to one hour officially. Uh, but anyway, the high-speed train situation is like everything else. The colonials develop infrastructure not to serve the natives, but to serve the colonizers. Uh, the high-speed train in Jerusalem, for example, is... Uh, intended to uh, serve the colonies in West Jerusalem and now East Jerusalem and basically drive the Palestinians out of Jerusalem. So it's taking land from the Palestinians to develop these kinds of infrastructures, some of them environmentally damaging as the, like the alternative roads, etc. Um, there is a question from uh, Ronald Mendel about the water organizations, access to water. Uh, yes, the Palestine Hydrology Group, the Palestinian Hydrology Group, and there's something called EWASH, E-W-A-S-H. You can Google for these organizations that work on issues of access to water, etc. Um, the uh, uh, 
do you have a profile of what you expect of volunteers, like how long, etc.? Uh, yes, uh, you can go on our website, again, palestinenature.org. Uh, there's a section volunteer, so palestinenature.org slash volunteer, and you get, can get all the information about what's expected of volunteers, etc. Um, and I see somebody already shared uh, from the Kumi team deadly exchange uh, link. Uh, what do you want the Americans to tell their government? Uh, I was going to say to fuck off, but then I, I'm in mixed company and uh, I should be a little more careful. Uh, governments lie to people and my government lies to me. Uh, the Israeli government that rules over us, and I hate to say also, but also the Palestinian Authority. All politicians or most politicians are really in it for themselves. And, uh, and uh, the way the world works is that politicians don't have a conscience and don't develop a conscience out of uh, inspiration or anything. What they do they stick their finger up in the air like this to see where the wind is blowing. And what we have to do is provide them with a hurricane to get them to change what they do. And that's what we in the U.S., I'm a U.S. citizen, by the way. In the U.S., if you look at all the positive things that have happened throughout the history of the U.S., like women's right to vote, like the civil rights, like ending the war in Vietnam, like ending U.S. support, for apartheid in South Africa, all of these things, 40-hour uh, work week, I could go on and on. All of them happened because people like you and me uh, got together and said, enough is enough, down to the street. And that's what they are doing now, so I encourage you to go down to the streets and push the governments. And it doesn't, it doesn't happen by changing from one political party to another. Uh, whether it's Democrat or Republicans, they need to be pushed to do the right thing. Um, I think I probably should stop now because it's 7 o'clock, unless the host tells me to answer a couple more questions. I could also answer some of the questions in the chat room. If the chat remains open, I'm happy to, to, uh, to answer some more questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, the host. Take it over. Over to you. <laughs> Nobody is there. Mike, Mike, unmute. Um, All right, want... Omar? Yes. Um, Thank you, Mazen. Um, uh, thank you, Mazen, for all of your commitment and dedication um, to Palestine, to human rights, to the world, and to all of the people who are um, who are engaged in different struggles. Um, I would like to share. Um, we are all very much affected. If you are in Palestine, and I'm sure if you are in many places around the world. Um, you're getting the news from the United States. Uh, what is happening in the United States is uh, um, um, we all know that there is discrimination in the United States and the people are resisting, um, although sometimes it only makes it into the news when there is violence, while a friend of mine told me that the majority of the protests, the white majority, has been nonviolent, has been very civilized, but this is not what the media wants to portray, unfortunately. But in Palestine, we very much stand in solidarity um, with what's happening um, in, um, in the United States. We stand with all of the people who are on the margins struggling. And a friend of mine, Reverend Waltrina, Dr. Waltrina, she has, um, uh, um, uh, she has sent me um, a beautiful reflection. Um, uh, and I thought it would be the right place for it to be shared in this group of, uh, um, of Fumi. Um, Reverend Ultrina, um, she is the executive director of the Community Renewal Society um, in the United States, a longtime activist and a longtime friend um, of the Palestinian people. So, Reverend Ultrina. Peace and solidarity with each of you, um, and just know that we are 
um, standing with our family and friends of Palestine in this struggle. This piece is called Pentecost, and this is dedicated to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Michael Brown, Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Tanisha Anderson, and the long litany of names of black and brown bodies killed by white supremacy and state-sanctioned violence in the US. Helicopters in the air, triggering my fears. What's next comes the rubber bullets piercing my body like they pierced Jesus, crying out for mama to behold thy son. I can't breathe. They don't even need guns. Castrate our bodies from the lynching trees. Cut off my lungs 10 minutes with his knees, crying out for mama, I can't breathe. Hands in his pockets with a grin on his face, resentment for my race as my life slips away. Cameras recording, America don't care. Black lives don't matter, even when our murders are broadcast on air. Evidence before the judge and no convictions to be seen. Yellow tapes, chalk stains on the crime scene. Blood stains cry out from these Trumpanian streets. Profit over people, we don't care if they die. Fuck COVID-19, let the fittest survive. Translate that to mean wealthy and the 1%. They say they cut us them checks, but black and brown folks still can't pay rent. In the food bank line trying to make ends meet, trying to make it to work, but the curfew ends at nine. Can't catch the bus because Lori shut down the lines. Martin says a riot is the language of the unheard. This Pentecost, Holy Ghost fire came down and cities burned. Maybe this is the new church, or the new birth of the church we wish to see to get us out of them pews and into the streets. A nightmare of hashtags trending, haunting me. Kendrick Lamar, won't you sing for me? Hear that beat bass drop and I start to believe we gonna be all right even if we must die. Clyde McKay said, let it be nobly done, fighting back for the generations to come. Lamentations lift every voice to a rising sun. James Weldon Johnson declared victory is won. Cut off my lungs, 10 minutes with his knees, crying out for mama, I can't breathe. Cut off my lungs, 10 minutes with his knees, crying out for mama, I can't breathe. They try to cut off my people's lungs, 10 minutes with his knees, crying out for mama, I can't breathe. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone. This has been amazing. I just wanted to take a quick minute to talk to you about the, the Kumi action that we have for this week. Uh, the Kumi action in the book and on the website for this week includes a few options for promoting support of and tourism to the Palestine Museum of Natural History. Uh, however, this year isn't really the time to be focusing on travel and tourism. Uh, instead, organizations such as the Palestine Institute of Biodiversity and Sustainability and museums such as the Palestine Museum of Natural History are struggling financially. As such, you can have most help out by running a quick fundraising drive and sending a contribution to the museum at uh, http www.palestinenature.org slash donations. And I'm going to post that in the chat here in just a second. Uh, do whatever you can, then share news of your donation and advocacy for the museum on social media if you can. Include a link to the page of the Kumi Now website along with the hashtags, uh, hashtag Kumi Now and hashtag Kumi33. And if you have any ideas on how to add to or promote, promote this action, um, please share it with our fellow advocates in the chat. Now we'd like to move on to a prayer. Let's pray. Dear Lord, everything you have created is good. We are so thankful for those who work for the Palestine Museum of Natural History and the Palestine Institute of Biodiversity and Sustainability as they look, to care, as they look carefully at the natural environment around them and educate others to share it, care for it in a respectful way. 
We pray that all our hearts will be filled with awe at the wonders we see around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you everyone for sticking around with us through the technical issues at the beginning. Uh, I trust that this was all well worth your time. Next week, we'll be joined by the Reverend Dr. Stephen Sizer. Stephen Sizer is the founder and director of Peacemaker Trust, a registered charity in the UK dedicated to peacemaking. He's the author of Zion's Christian Soldiers, the Bible, Israel, and the Church, and he'll help us understand Christian Zionism and what can be done to counter its influence. We hope to see you all back here next week, and if you like what you've seen today, we'd greatly appreciate it if you help spread the word to friends and family, classes and church groups, and online through social media. And I'd like to remind you that uh, this session is available on Facebook, and, all, um, and it'll be available on our website. I'll post that link again here in just a second, and um, along with all the, the PowerPoint presentations and everything. Um, now we've reached the formal end of the meeting, but if you'd like to hang around, our guests have offered to answer questions in chat. We know people have a lot of other online meetings and responsibilities nowadays, so please don't feel obligated that you have to stick around. Feel free to hang up. Um, we'll also be saying goodbye to anyone watching on Facebook at this time. Thank you. <laughs>